Great, Russ, and thanks so much. Welcome everyone to this session on unlocking the smart robotics revolution. Now is really the time to be thinking about robotics and autonomous systems, also called RAS or smart machines. Smart machines are physically are physical systems that can act independently of human control by sensing, reasoning, and adapting to the world around them. And government has invested 447 million since 2014 in projects related to RAS and with universities and industry pledging a further 227 million. So there's, you know, there's funds in this. Why are they investing? Well, because these technologies have a crucial role to play in our future prosperity and productivity. And it turns out that the UK has the potential to lead and be a global, global player uh, in, in smart robotics. So this robotics revolution is not happening in a silo. It also fits in the, with the wider support that's happening around digital and physical infrastructure, which includes the new Office for AI, uh, the Made Smarter initiative to support automation manufacturing, the Center for Connected Autonomous Vehicles, and RAS support that's happening across the board, whether it's in drones and in maritime industries and in nuclear, offshore, agriculture, healthcare, space, you name it. Uh, so really, from my perspective, it's an exciting time to be in smart robotics. And to tell you more uh, about this today, we have a stellar panel from the Robotics Growth Partnership. Uh, the partnership was convened by government in 2019 with members from both academia and industry. You can see some, some uh, aspect of that representation today. And our goal really is to put the UK at the cutting edge of the smart robotics revolution. So I thought we could start by having everyone introduce themselves briefly and tell us what they do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So maybe we can start with you, Paul. Sure. I'm Paul Clark. I'm uh, Chief Technology Officer at Ocado. Um and um, we we really live at this intersection of of sort of smart machines, um, you know, uh, AI, digital twins, and, and other technologies, and and they they power you know our end to end uh, fulfillment and logistic platforms that we're now selling around the world. So I suppose on a daily basis, uh, I lead something called the Office of uh, the CTO. And uh, we're focused on the, the sort of forward-facing uh, edge of, of what we do, particularly that outside of grocery. Uh, so moving all sorts of different kinds of atoms around in smart ways, hopefully. All right, David. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David Lane. I'm a professor and founding director in the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics, which is a sort of joint venture between Edinburgh and Harriet Watt University. Is in Edinburgh, uh, but I'm also chairman of uh, Consequential Robotics and Innova Robotics, and I invest in other uh, businesses which I won't name. Uh, and so, my life to answer Sabine's question, what do I spend my time doing? Some of the time, I'm doing sort of research stuff and leading Orca Hub, which is one of the examples of the funding that uh, Sabine mentioned for robots and hazardous environments. Um, funded from the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, um, but I also spend time, you know, working with companies and in companies to make this smart robotics revolution happen. So I have the privileged position of being part of creating the technology through uh, over 100 PhD students we've got in the centre at the moment, and, and with colleagues there, of course, not just me, but but also bringing that to the marketplace and understanding the dynamics of the marketplace in, in different sectors. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Samia? Yeah, I'm Samia Neftimezzani, I'm Professor of Robotics and AI at University of Salford. I hold the University Chair in Robotics and I'm the founder of the uh, Azar Center, which is Center for Robotics and Autonomous Systems, which is the one spoke of one of the EPSRC hub in robotics, uh, funded through Industrial Strategy, and I'm also the co-founder of the National Robotics Network. Great, and James? Afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's James Kell. I, I work for Rolls-Royce PLC. So we're kind of famously a, an engine or jet engine manufacturer, and uh, we don't actually make money making jet engines anymore. We make money when they fly. So um, we may need to make sure that we have those things operating safely and, and when they should be. So my job is to develop new technologies, new, new techniques to go and address issues in the fleet when, whenever those arise. So we've got networks of sensors all over the engine. We can get huge amounts of data and we can kind of stream and understand and kind of really manage our our expectation for maintenance really well and the job i'm doing is to develop technologies so that we can actually go out and perform surgery inside those things 
And because it's such a specialist task, it's uh, it's often we're looking at various kind of quite customized robotic type solutions. So I work with a whole host of universities and we've making, been, been making a lot of good use of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund uh, money to kind of perform those those activities and move the whole thing along. So I'm very keen to kind of make uh, best use of the the RGP, the Robotic Growth Partnership here, just to kind of push on the, um, the UK base for robotics. So thanks for having me. Great. And I'm Sabine Howard. Uh, I'm based at the Bristol Robotics Laboratory, where my team designs swarms uh, from the nanoscale, thinking of nanobots to treat cancer, all the way to larger sizes for things like swarms and logistics or for environmental monitoring. And I also run two nonprofits called RoboHub.org and AIHub.org to connect the robotics and AI communities to the public. So I was lucky this morning to be part of a, a fireside chat with David and Paul on digital twins in a crisis. And uh, I was just wondering if you could recap a little bit what you think the robotics of the future might look like. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> We've done this quite a few times now, I guess. We had a great session this morning. It was very interesting. We had good questions from everybody, both during the session and afterwards, were quite thought-provoking ones. And, and really, I think what we were trying to get across was our, own, our the passion we both have for the potential of smart machines in the future. We, we've heard, we're hearing examples from everybody this morning already, this afternoon, rather, of the kinds of things we're working on. Um, and we think there's much, much more to be done to make ourselves more resilient, more prepared for pandemic and other kinds of shock to the systems of how we live. And so key to that, I think, was the, the way that we're able to work together in order to develop across organizations, across uh, startups, large companies, uh, uh, university research groups, catapults, in, in order to be able to design and develop and implement these, 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 these advanced systems. And I think what Paul and I have collectively recognized is, is that we just don't have the right level of design tools and connectivity that allow us to go on the journey of starting the simulation, then moving to emulation where you've got some hardware in the loop, you're using a digital twin in order to you know, try different variations of the, uh, of the system you're working on, and then move to a living lab, an environment where you can test safely and then eventually out to the, the real world and the, i think the things we were trying to get across were what the opportunity will be to develop some of this digital infrastructure as a as an open co collective commons of tools and apis and middleware that will allow organizations to connect what they do in, in as open a way as, as they want to and therefore i build community and resilience paul how could things have looked different, Paul, if we had these digital commons in place and in the context of the COVID uh, situation? Well, I think those those companies like Biden Carter and Rolls Royce and and others who have these uh, this deep capability around uh, these kind of synthetic environments, you know, uh, and, and probably have certainly in our case, I know that we've been able to pretty much kind of carry on our research and and innovation you know, um, largely uninterrupted, but with people working from their homes, you know, using these environments, you know, that's great for us, but what we need to do is make them much more available. And I think if we if we had these commons, you know, in place, then we could start stitching together all of these different models so that they could, uh, they could be built by lots of different companies with lots of different um, technologies, including this open source initiative that, that David alluded to. Um, in order to combine them into much more powerful models, uh, because we don't want to turn this into some kind of mammoth IT project, which has to be kind of done as one one big bang, but rather we want it to be about crowdsourcing these different elements, but using the smart glue to make sure they they stick together and can talk to one another, and that the you know um, the, the the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. And I think if if we had had that, um, and we uh, and the the this kind of digital infrastructure in place, we could have probably you know responded m much more effectively, um, you know, in terms of coming up with uh, new smart machines um, to help us. But also, you know, going back a stage further, if we had the smart machines woven into our everyday lives, then they could have 
uh, being a force for good to help us, you know, with all sorts of things from manufacturing to, you know, delivering uh, important supplies uh, and going, you know, going into places where we'd rather keep humans out of in order to keep them safe. So um, I think we would have just been able to do, you know, a lot, a lot more. Um, and therefore, now the focus needs to be on how do we prepare ourselves, this resilience that David, David alluded to, in order not only to prepare ourselves for future kind of shocks, but also, you know, to harness the opportunities that these uh, technologies can can yield in terms of, you know, efficiency and and safety and and indeed the competitive advantage um, of the UK. And David, the, the crisis has brought to light the need for this infrastructure to be able to design new robots quickly and deploy them in these realistic environments. But how, how is this going to be useful beyond the crisis in other areas, maybe in SMEs or in startups? So I think you know, that's, a great, that's a great question. In, you know, from the point of view of SMEs, those SMEs who don't have a strong robotics uh, activity but who want to get involved in robotics could make use of this infrastructure to do that, to prototype the kind of robots they might want to use. They do some of this kind of thing already, but not enough. And so, you know, it's going to be one of the ways that we can bring uh, SMEs kind of along on the journey. And SMEs, of course, you know, they don't have deep pockets generally because they're not very big, right, by definition. So it's a big commitment for them to get on board with something as, as big and meaty as, as this. And the, the hope is that by having this connectivity between researchers and other companies, you know, it's something that will actually lower the barrier to adoption in SMEs. That's the vision. So it, it begs the question of why this hasn't happened already. What do we need in terms of leadership uh, to make this type of smart robotics transformation uh, be, become a reality? Uh, so maybe Paul or David, if you want yeah. to chime in. So I'll have a go at that. I, I, I think the starting point for me, for me certainly, is is around vision. You know, I, I think we need to build a properly, you know, big, bold, holistic, compelling vision. You know, um, for what this smart, prosperous, equitable, efficient, sustainable, now resilient UK needs to look like. Because without that. You don't kind of know where you're headed, you know, and so that I think is the first thing we need to need to make sure we know what it is that we're we're trying to build, you know, with this technology and and you know how it fits with you know us as human beings and uh, and then you know armed with that, I think we have an amazing opportunity uh, in the same way that you know my business, uh, you know, Cardo has has uses itself in terms of what it does in the UK to develop technologies that then it can sell you know, as part of our platform business around the world. Well, I think the UK can do the same. We can use the UK as a Petri dish. We can use, we can, you can use all of this, these technologies to, to, you know, to help transform the UK. And then on the back of that, as well as, you know, improving, you know, our lives and our productivity and, and so forth, we can create new products and services that hopefully we can sell around the world. And I think that's, that's the uh, the big opportunity we have. It's it's bigger than just if you like what we can do here in the UK, and I think that really is about you know vision. It's about leadership. It's about you know seeing the sense of the possible of what we can do here, and then you know supporting uh, you know this sector, but also you know our, our our friends in terms of you know the AI and as you say, made smarter in order to work smartly together. So that's that's the vision. Uh, but how do we make it happen on the ground? Maybe, Samia, can you help us walk through some of the, the enablers that could allow uh, robotics to flourish in the UK? Well, to make robotics happen in the UK, we need to not only to tackle the technical aspect, which is uh, for us that, that we know, but also the, I think it's, it's more important to have the, the supporting infrastructure uh, which goes with it, including regulation, standards, innovation, you know, investment, testing facilities, demonstrator, and the uh, skill development, which is really key as well, all those will form the essential part of growing the UK RAS capability in the UK. When you look at in the last few years, uh, the UK government has made substantial funding available for growing this capability and infrastructure. For example, I can name a few, the hubs and the center of excellence in RAS, where we have this world-class research and innovation uh, uh, undertaking. Now, the issue with those are they were uh, quite silo in their approach of 
really to robotics and that's why the RGP represents really an opportunity for to bring uh, to in bringing all these uh, hubs together to work closely with in a, in a united approach uh, to moving in order to move uh, forward the robotics adoption in the UK. Other things uh, we would we could, which could help as well uh, to make it happen is to have, for example, centers of excellence or innovation hubs. In addition to what just Paul and and David have said about the digital comms, which are really crucial, then having as well those centers and hubs outside the universities could, uh, uh, and identified mainly by industry, of course, could uh, with, with the involvement of uh, uh, some private sectors or academia, government will allow a, a, a varied approach in developing ideas, innovation, and so on. This is one type of uh, a key enabler. Another type could be labs and test facilities, which are really crucial. Yeah, we have a number of the already tested facilities here in the UK and universities and the much wider public sector like Salafid and so on. However, the issue with the university testing facilities are not usually available for students or uh, for non-university students or researchers they are excluding then large large number of inventors potentially a good sme who could have a brilliant idea but he just could simply can access those facilities there is an opportunity there maybe as well to make it happen is for to get public and private sector to partner to create a more uh, let's say a space that will nurture innovation entrepreneurship in robotics and uh, for uh, then for robotics engineers to develop concepts and the uh, concepts and ideas. Another key enabler, I would say, are catapults, which are really important and uh, maker spaces. When you look at the UK, RA has funded uh, uh, quite strong catapult programs that provides provide a substantial, I said, amount of support to businesses. However, they are limited in what they can do. Uh, usually restricted. Then the issue is a lack of adequate access as well for SMEs, small, especially small SMEs, to those maker spaces, especially outside as well, could, could hold, hold back some kind of commercialization opportunities. Then we need as well to uh, increase maybe funding to support startup engagement, to support maybe more maker spaces and testing hubs. Uh, uh, and widespread use of living labs around the UK. That is, uh, that could be accessible to, to everybody, basically. Then uh, to summarize, basically, in terms of infrastructure, we need a quite a large national uh, living labs uh, demonstrator that could really uh, accelerate the adoption of the, uh, of the robotics in the UK. Uh, one thing I have, and uh, it's very important as, a, as an enabler as well, which is not not, not uh, linked to the technical aspect, to our regulations, then we need to define uh, maybe a cross industry regulations, safety, you know, standards, frameworks, uh, or legal frameworks for autonomy, uh, and maybe insurance as well. Um, last but not least, in my opinion, which is really a, a key enabler and the most important is we need to have a strong, really sustainable supply chain, UKRS supply chain. Without this supply chain, it, uh, a strong one, uh, specialized in RAS, it will be difficult to deliver any new or innovative RAS product or services that can respond to a mixed application challenges in the RAS sector. Uh, I think that we need to have to provide the, the those UK businesses with, the, uh, I would say, even a single source of uh, access to workforce training and skills upgrade in RAS to meet the industry needs. I love that answer because there's so many specifics and pointers that people can go to and it sounds like it's really an effort to bring it all together so that there's 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 a common way to go about uh, understanding robots and designing them um, and enabling them really. Uh, and uh, I thought it's interesting uh, in terms of the skills. Do you want to develop a little bit more what you were thinking uh, in, in terms of what skills are needed uh, to make this happen? Okay, then uh, as I said, skills is a key enabler to, to make the robotics happen in the UK. Whilst there are some universities, of course, already offering some courses undergraduate or postgraduate in robotics and artificial intelligence, the UKRI has, as well, I think in the last, let's say, four or five years, made substantial investment in training uh, 
or maybe eight years apologies yeah in uh, funding cdts uh, which are incredibly uh, useful and important to develop and train the uk capability uh, academic capability in specialized aspect of robotics However, there is an opportunity as well. Uh, the problem is they are long, not necessarily linked to industry. Then opportunity, if research is commercially, for example, that the, those uh, PhDs is commercially, uh, research that they are doing is commercially uh, relevant, can lead to new opportunities, for example, in UK RAS, uh, in, uh, in uh, RAS. Uh, I talked earlier about building strong RAS uh, supply chain. I think we need to develop uh, the RGB again represents an opportunity to act as the industry voice for to government on the strategic scale issues affecting uh, uh, our industry and work maybe closely with range of key industry stakeholders, uh, supporters uh, and partners in delivering the uh, mission of making RAS industry in the UK uh, the best uh, in the world. Uh, an example just could, could be, for example, producing regional strategies to capture the, the need, the long-term, I, I would say, long-term skills uh, forecast for the RAS. Uh, identified skills gaps in different region and professional development needs and supportive infrastructure via, for example, the use of existing industrial uh, academic networks um, could be a, a, a good way and also uh, hopefully that will enable uh, to set up curriculum for education establishments uh, to align the industry, uh, to align the industrial needs, to promote employment in the sector, to close skills gap in industry and academia, and hopefully uh, to enable as well a cultural change, which is more, most important in the use of us uh, through understanding uh, its benefit. I think there's also something about the skills of not necessarily those developing the robotics and AIs, um, but also in using them uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the shop floor. Um, is, is there anything that's needed to train the future users of robotics rather than the future uh, roboticists? Yeah, I think we need to work very closely with schools and uh, to develop, I mean, uh, the robotics uh, shouldn't be really uh, taught in at, at a only at the university level, but it should really uh, start from a primary uh, school. And I think that we need to rethink completely the way we are dealing with it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, involving uh, the primary schools and, uh, and uh, also high schools from the beginning in basically uh, uh, teaching those subjects related to robotics. I mean, it's not only artificial intelligence and so on would be really uh, important. David, did you want to add something? Yeah, but when we talk to industry about this problem of skills or challenge of skills, what we hear is that there are really very few opportunities for apprentices. And maybe you know, James will talk about this from the Rolls Royce point of view, the very strong culture of apprenticeships. Um, there are very few opportunities and very few training courses, if any, you know, in the, in the, uh, the colleges of uh, higher, further education. You know, the colleges of further education are starving compared to the universities, which are very rich. And, and there's a real need to you know, have NVQs, for example, where people can go and recognize courses. And the catapults are doing that to some extent, but they, 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 they can't do enough of it. And it needs to be something more um, leveling up across the country and the colleges of further education are the way to go. So we hope to work on that in the RGP. Yeah. Um James, maybe you can help us understand what we can do so industries feel like they can adopt the technology. What is what is their pipeline uh, to go from something that looks like it's research-based to actually having it deployed within their company? Yeah, I guess for me, a lot of this is about publicity and visibility, and I suppose in some ways perception as well. But that's that's a, a kind of another point, really, I think, that you, you um, want to raise. But um, I think really it's, a, it's about just kind of for us in, in in the business world we're we're all kind of got our heads heads to the grindstone working on an issue and we need to remember or i suppose the robotics community needs to remember or be aware that actually the people in in industry big big kind of adopters potentially they don't really care about the robot they care about a thing being done so we can talk about smart machines and robotics but actually we just need a job doing better or at all maybe in some cases and maybe safer um, but that, that's really the point. It's just kind of a smart machine will facilitate those things, but it's and it's a tool to kind of unlock those new capabilities. 
Paul, I think, did you have your hand raised? You did, yes, Paul, I, I, I did, but I didn't want to interrupt you, James, so I can carry on <laughs> with you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, I I feel like from an adoption perspective, I think we've we in the UK actually got a great opportunity because we're we're small enough to really collaborate with each other across all sorts of different industries and sectors, and populate all sorts of different universities and other SMEs into that kind of melting pot, etc. And we're but we're also big enough to really make a difference and do those things. The ISCF funding, for instance, uh, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, has been great for helping helping us in, in Rolls Royce get really to grips with what could be possible from a nuclear um, maintenance perspective as well as aerospace maintenance perspective. But unless we kind of keep doing those things, those those funding streams, if they dry up, we could lose all sorts of really good people that we have kind of invested in really as a country. We don't want those guys to, to kind of walk out the door effectively. Um, but I suppose one of the other really big things from an industrial perspective is we, and there's a kind of double-edged sword to this, but we, we in industry need to be better at sharing our issues and seeing where those robotics or smart machine systems with kind of basis is within AI and data um, acquisition really could make a difference. And if we're able to understand what could be done, then we'd probably be more likely to share those issues and conversely i suppose one of the perceptions that that people in industry may have is that actually this type of industry the robotics world is is really being pushed by academics at this point and it's people are kind of looking at those things in the labs and i'm trying to understand what could be done and we need to kind of try to translate those 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 results into a business proposition um, and one of the things I think that's actually helped an awful lot is the EPSRC hubs that have really broken down a lot of the barriers between industry and academia because they've not classically focused on an EPSRC standard research kind of technology readiness level, I suppose. They've been slightly more advanced development projects. So it's, I suppose the, the point is there's less imagination required for the guys like me in, in industry to kind of go and actually try to make use of these things. So what is it that's needed? Is it, is it better tools? Is it infrastructure? Is it just being in a common place? Uh, I, I think being, being in a common place would help, I think. Um, I think we also, also need to just remember that we, we as a country, we've, we've succeeded in doing this kind of stuff quite a lot. It's, um, I suppose one of the problems is whenever this type of activity does succeed, and it maybe gets picked up favorably in the media where where, for, for example, Paul's Ocado robots, um, the fleet of, of devices picking and placing things, that it's almost as, as if the robot is then second nature. And that's, that's good in a way, because that, that's how it should be. But we need to kind of, I suppose, work on the public perception piece to ensure that these, these things get, um, get, that the message lands, I suppose. Paul, do you wanna, did you wanna chime in? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to, I mean, I'm very conscious that we're speaking at a an AI um, uh, centric conference. But I, one of the things I feel very passionately about is this. You know, the really exciting things happen at this interface between the physical and the digital. And um, you know, uh, I think one of the challenges is that you know people often say that you know hardware is hard. Well, it is. You know, and and um, you know, on this kind of cyber physical graphic equalizer. You know, um, the digital, you know, is more accessible and it's some for some people it's more sort of, you know, exciting and 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 um, intellectual and whatever. But, you know, I think there's a job to be done there because we need to um, uh, we need to redress the balance, if you like. We need to turn up the volume on the physical. We need to make it easier as as some of you were saying, you know, we need more maker labs. We need to make it easier for people to. Uh, have a go, you know, as a maker lab so literally through the wall back there because I got so fed up uh, with not being able to have access to one that we built one, but you know, not everybody has the luxury to do that. But the point is, it's, it's, it is because, um, you know, these facilities, you know, are not in abundance and, and, but some of it is an educational challenge too, and a perception challenge, because, you know, subjects at school, you know, if you're doing double maths, you know, that's somehow seen as on a different level to doing DT. You know, if you're if you're a software engineer, 
you know, somehow that's somehow maybe seen differently from if you're getting your hands dirty, you know, doing engineering. And we, we need to fix that perception because we need both. And as I say, the really exciting stuff happens where those two worlds collide. And that's where, you know, the digital twins we were talking about earlier this morning support that intersection of the physical and the digital. And so um, I think uh, that's part of what the RGP needs to do is to turn up the dial on, on the physical world of, of robotics and smart machines. You're right. I think there's a, a challenge with most companies not feeling like robotics is for them or there isn't something out there that would solve the specific tasks that they need automating. What do, what do we tell these companies? Who should, who should be adopting robots and how do we knock on their door? Maybe James? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the short answer to that is, is everybody really should be able to in some way, shape or form. And it might not be something that you would consider calling a robot, but that, that is often the case. It's, it's quite often kind of wrapped up into the detail because as Paul is saying, hardware is hard, but actually those are the bits that make, make the kind of turn the digital tool into a reality. So where we can actually have something tangible as an output. We, we in, in Rolls Royce, we've had to um, accompany those types of issues by kind of coming up with different ideas to kind of fix issues that we've had, but then go out and find people that could help us work on them because we don't have the skills to do it perhaps in-house. So I've been working with all sorts of different collaborators across different universities and other SMEs to make those things happen. Um, we need, we need more, more ways of being able to share what's possible, I think and people that are able to bridge the gap between working in industry and the university to try to translate from both ends of the scale, I suppose. Any any tips on the translation from, from universities to industry before we move on? Um, keep it simple. I guess context is everything. We're providing different examples. And maybe for the academics, reach out early on in the process so they don't end up with, with a product or an idea that no one actually wants. Uh, so it's, it's probably a lesson that people know <laughs> yeah. right, that we don't put in practice when we're actually trying to do it ourselves. Uh, may, maybe I'll jump in here. We've actually been thinking about perception for, for quite some time on my side. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face, I think, is that most people don't interact with robots uh, every day in their lives or in their workplaces. And as a result, perception is largely driven by news headlines that are sometimes a little bit hype or, or science fiction, if you've watched Black Mirror. Uh, that's the thing of my existence right now when I say I'm a swarm engineer. Uh, there, there's also quite poor awareness overall about some of these technologies. So for example, the report from the Royal Society showed that only 10% of the UK population knew the term machine learning, for example. And these are gonna be core to the things that we're discussing uh, today. So I, th I think it's clear that if we want people to adopt uh, robots in their homes, if we want industries to consider them in their workflow, uh, flow, if we want workers to see them as useful tools, uh, we're, we're going to need a change of, of perception so that they see these as the go-to uh, when they're looking at a task to automate or to streamline. Um, the way this happens, I think, I think there's different ways we can make this happen. One is by having real people tell us stories about how their robots have been useful. Uh, so we recently ran a use case study uh, with firefighters, people who work in warehouses, and workers who do bridge inspection, asking them whether they thought swarm robotics would be useful for them. And we had gone in thinking that they would think this was a crazy idea. Um, but it turns out when you ask people about their day-to-day -day work life, they can imagine it. And all of a sudden, ideas of things that could be automated pop up. And all of a sudden, they actually do get excited. So we had a lot of positive vibes, which we were encouraged about. Uh, but a lot of what they were saying was, yes, this is great, but. And the but was, but if it's reliable, but if it's easy to use, but if it's not too expensive. And I think it's really understanding those different uses in which people might see the technology, um, which is going to be very beneficial. Because if we do then deploy these in their everyday lives, they're the ones who will be telling us the stories of how this was useful for them. Something that came out as well is that um, they thought these technologies were great as long as it was done to help them and not as a replacement for what they saw as their core expertise. So for example, we were designing a firefighting robot thinking they wanted robots to extinguish fires, but that was their core expertise as firefighters. And so they'd much rather have robots to help them gather information. But if we have these use cases and the more mundane robotics uh, and we tell stories about them, I think we'll be able to help people imagine how they could be useful on a more daily basis. 
The other thing I think that would be helpful change in is how we tell stories about robotics. Uh, so we're quite fortunate though that social media allows us to have direct conversations a little bit like we're having now uh, with industry, with, with users, with the public. Um, and it allows us, the researchers, the roboticists, to demystify some of this technology. Um, and it allows us to listen as well to some of the needs uh, that the community might have so that we're not all speaking in silos. And so as part of that, I think we need a couple of things that were mentioned. We need um, a community that's tech literate. So that goes back to what Samia was saying with teaching even at the younger levels, just making sure people know the basics of what this technology is. And so they can understand uh, a discussion about robotics. It's also for us roboticists, I think, to communicate better about these technologies. Um, and then it's it's about us all communicating through a common platform uh, so that we are actually not just talking in silos, uh, but sharing a common communication platform. And that's part of what we're doing uh, with RoboHub and AI Hub. So, so perception really, it comes down to making sure that everyone knows about robotics, uh, what it's for, uh, and is empowered to use the technology, but there's still a lot of a lot of work uh, along that line. Does anyone have any comments about the perception side and how we can improve perception in robotics? Feel free to raise your hand. I, yeah. I think, uh, sorry, James, David, I, I expect we're not gonna say the same thing. Um, I think from a use case perspective, I think we've got a great example coming up at the head of all of these ISCF projects, they should be reaching a, a good conclusion where we should have some really exciting demonstrations of new capability. I know from the, the projects I'm involved with, with uh, that are funded by Innovate UK, we've got some really exciting demonstrations of, of keyhole like surgery going to be performed on jet engines, for example, as well as I know in, in some of the EPSRC hubs, there's going to be some really exciting demonstrations on all sorts of different kind of platforms. So these are kind of use case oriented demonstrations that we ought to be able to write some kind of um, piece about that should help with that publicity um, aspect, I imagine, or at least hope. Sorry, David, I jumped in. Yeah, David, that's great. No, just to build on that, uh, James, um, you know, I'm, some of the programs we're running, we're actively looking at ways that we can take the demonstrations you're talking about uh, and new capabilities to your point about you want to get the job done, it's not about the robot. Um, and get it on people's screens through social media, through webinars, you know, because right now in the current COVID situation, everyone's looking at a screen, right? So there's never been a better time to get people's attention and to, and to, and to change perceptions. The point I was going to make was really about, I've, I've been very pleased in the, probably the last 18 months plus to see the media moving away from the, the normal narrative that robots take jobs, which I think is a big perception that people have had in the past. And there's a record, growing recognition that everybody gets that actually they create jobs. They're just different jobs and you need different skills to be able to do that. If we go back to the other discussion about apprenticeships and training and skills and so on. Um, and so and, and the robots aren't there to replace us, as others have said. Robots are there to support us, to work alongside us, um, take away the dull, dirty, dangerous, all those things. Um, so that, that's been an important shift that we want to continue to emphasize. And that um, when, when we become comfortable with using robots, we don't call them a robot, we call it something else. And, and so, for example, you, you may have seen in Milton Keynes, there are delivery systems going around on the redways, I think they're called, um, which are, actually they do still call them robots, I think, which are uh, delivering food. Uh, and so Uber Eats and other uh, uh, supermarkets in the Milton Keynes area are doing the delivery that way. And everybody I know who lives in Milton Keynes thinks they're cute and they love them. Um, and they certainly don't feel threatened by them. And Milton Keynes is a city designed, you know, by accident probably to be robot friendly, um, unlike other cities. So, so that's that's a sort of very encouraging sign, I think, that um, perceptions are changing, but it's still work in progress. And I like this idea of robots as co-workers. So, Paul, I told you that my household is fed through Oka is, is fed through Ocado during this lockdown. Um, and actually, I really loved it because one of the the delivery men came and had the box with the bags in it, and there was something a little bit twitched with the bag, and he said, "Oh, the robot did something <laughs> wrong," which I loved because it brought this this idea of robots working with people and then really talking to you know as if they were colleagues. So I thought that was a brilliant statement. He didn't understand while I was why I was uh, laughing. Um, so this is great. I think we've put in place a number of things from enablers to adoption to perception. 
Uh, but Paul and, and, and David, you started with a grand vision of how robots could have helped in the COVID situation and how we need to build this digital commons to make it happen in the future if this were to occur again. Um, are these the right steps to make that happen or are we forgetting anything? Uh, is, there, is there a summarizing way forward? Well, there's definitely, uh, I mean, most of us have talked about it in different ways, but, you know, we really do need to reframe this idea of, of infrastructure. Uh, you know, yes, yes, it's roads and railways and, you know, um, other kinds of physical infrastructure, but it's also, you know, big digital infrastructure like this, this, these commons and the, and, and the, the synthetic environments we were talking about this morning to make, you know, uh, to allow us to, um, to create these machines because they don't pop out of nowhere, you know. Uh, um, they have a, a kind of a, a gestation, gestation and growth cycle, you know, in, in a, in similar to, to humans. I mean, very different humans, but similar in the sense that you know you need to take them from you know um, their their conception, if you like, you know, in uh, inside these simulations, all the way through to kind of adult life, and and you know, and then. Once they've been through the living labs, let them out, and then, when necessary, you know, go back and help them when they get stuck and teach them new tricks. So it's you know, and you need to do that, you know, as part of everyday life. As David was saying, it's a success when you no longer think of them as a, or, or maybe James, no longer think of them as a robot, because I think then you know you realise that you've won that kind of adoption and perception thing. People are just taking them for granted as part of their everyday life in the same way that we take other kinds of of machines for granted, and and uh, you know, really, these these may be smarter, but they're no different. They're just machines, you know, and and um, you know, they can they can help us, um, but we have to learn, you know, how to live with them effectively, how to work with them effectively, uh, what we want to delegate to them, and so you know, it's a process of sort of getting in there and and experimenting and 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 trying rather than. You know, when you suddenly need them for a crisis, you know, like this, expecting them to sort of, you know, pop out of, as I say, thin air, it's just not going to happen. So, so that's really the, the the task that I think we're now focused on. And and you know, there are some fantastic areas like healthcare, uh, which might be a priority. Great, David. Any any final closing thoughts? Uh, very quickly, because we're running out of time, I can tell. Um, co the COVID situation is an accelerator of the adoption here because we live in what some people are calling the new low touch economy and robotics is one of the technologies that's going to an ai that's that's really going to help us do that from restaurants to factories to remote working of all sorts so it's an exciting time and it's timely that this initiative is coming when it is great thank you samia james david and paul and please join us for the q a Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.